All right. It's state of mind. Hi. Um, if you like what you see, because if I don't say it now, I'll always forget. It, hit the button right here. La, 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 la. Okay. Not funny. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I think I'm a comedian during the introduction. So today I have uh, someone. Uh, it's the first time ever on State of Mind that I have a casting director. It, it, he, he, not just a casting director, probably one of the top five casting directors or maybe even top three uh, in the world. And, and when I say that, you're probably thinking, yeah. Well, let's just, let me just tell you so I don't get it wrong. What the uh, Rolling Stone said about him. He's, he writes Rolling Stone. You guys know who Rolling Stone is? Uh, uh, he's an actor's casting director. TV Guide said, unparalleled track record in finding top new talent. TV Guide, Rolling Stone. Uh, he's won about, I think it's nine Emmys, but I think it's actually 10 because I, uh, <laughs> I was looking up how many Emmys he won and it's one said nine, but then one said 10 and I'm like, whoa, okay. So it's probably 10, 10 Emmys. So there you are. Uh, and he's won other, many other casting awards, whatnot. So his name is, and he's the casting director for. General Hospital. See how I pause? Mark Teshner. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that good enough for you, bro? I feel like <laughs> I'm being interviewed by Sonny Corinthos and not Maurice Bernard. You've got like all the, all of a sudden Sonny was here and I'm like, <laughs> am I going to be murdered or interviewed? <laughs> but thanks for the great... Intro, uh, intro. Uh, that was awesome. Well, it's just, you know, it's the truth. And this, a lot of times when it's the truth, it's kind of like beautiful that I, that I can praise the truth. Well, I appreciate it. I, I don't want to have to lie about, you know. Um, the, the other thing, Mark, I want to talk to you about, I, I don't know if you're very private. There's nothing about you. I couldn't find anything about your life. I, Everywhere I looked, I was like, Oh, okay, 10 Emmys, 10 Emmys, the greatest casting director. Where'd you grow up? I'm not, I'm, it's funny, I'm not secret about my life at all. Wow. Uh, I don't make an effort to avoid social media. I mean, yeah. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, but again, and I've posted personal photos, wow. but nothing, you know, I think that people go too far revealing everything about them that, including what sandwich they ate. But I was born in New York City. Uh, I was born in Harlem, New York, to a hospital that does not exist anymore. Really? Yeah, yeah, 138th and 5th. And born in New York, and I was raised in a suburb of New York called Scarsdale. It's a pretty well-known town. It's a pretty well-known uh, middle-class community in Westchester. You got the Scarsdale diet doctor and things like that. Uh, Scarsdale, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty... Yeah. Pretty well-known suburb. Great for me because I had this suburban growing up, you know, baseball, sports, normal public school, but 30 minutes from New York City. Uh, so I had access to Yankee Stadium, which I went to a lot. Oh, really? And also my parents were very into theater and dance. So at a young age, I was going to New York, seeing shows, seeing ballet. My first Broadway show, I think I saw when I was 10 years old. So uh, it was called, it was a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. Yes, a musical about Superman. Really? Um, I don't think it ran long. But so I was lucky in that I was able to experience theater and culture. And, you know, I got, and, and I got hooked at just, uh, you know, a young age. Did you start acting after that? I did. I started acting and I did, you know, all the high school plays, all the college plays. I was a... Uh, English and theater major in college. 
And not that any major prepares you for life, but I always feel like where you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be. Yeah. So then I, after college in Connecticut, I went back to New York City as a kid right out of college, and I pursued acting for a couple of years, maybe two and a half years or so. And I had this epiphany one day after another audition that I liked the idea of acting more than actually acting. Wow. And it just, I, I can't tell you when or how it crystallized, but something shifted in me. And then, strangely enough, through my mother, who knew a friend of a friend, it was an opening as a casting assistant. And so I became a casting assistant. I literally went from actor to casting assistant making no money but wait a minute why didn't you why didn't because we can get into this sure. discussion which is because i don't love acting like obviously like i used to because it's too painful okay yes and before i i invited the pain oh i'm a young actor i don't care come on right but for my health it wasn't good why didn't you love acting doing it because it, maybe it's the acting lifestyle, uh, the life of an actor, the dynamic of being an actor, that sense of no control. Uh, although in real life, what control do we have also yeah. if you want to get philosophical? But it just felt like, I felt like I was drifting and I wanted to get some semblance of control back, whatever that means. So, uh, Because when you're acting, a lot of it's out of control. Well, it wasn't so much that. I don't mind being out of control as an actor. I mean, the business, the lifestyle. Oh, okay. all, I get you, I get you know, you. it's very, you know, pounding the pavement in New yeah, York. Yeah. And I just don't think I was cut out for that kind of life. And it's interesting. Now that I'm in casting, and I'll, I totally made the right decision when I see the process and 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 how many actors etc i i i never looked back to begin with but now i really don't look back but the great thing for me about being trained as an actor is it made me the casting director i am now that doesn't mean great casting directors have to have an acting background many don't but that was my background so i came in with this respect for acting liking actors yeah. but also understanding the craft of acting and the language of yes. the craft of acting so that when an actor comes to audition if i want to give them an adjustment and work with them i'll speak the actor's language i won't yeah. just say do this yeah. or do that which is superficial but i'll try to connect from an organic authentic place with that actor because i know the language to hopefully open something up in the room to help them be the best they can be. Yeah. So the background I had brought me to where I am. And I'm so grateful for those years of pounding the pavement and, you know, working but on how, jobs. How, did you pound the pavement a lot as a casting director? No, no, I meant as an Yeah, actor. but did you? Um, well, you know, when I started out in casting, uh, you don't really have many accounts. So like anything, you have yeah. to build your reputation. And it starts with one regional theater, then another. Ah. Uh, it was, there were periods where there was not much income coming in. And so, and then I ended up becoming a partner and we had this office in New York, Myers Teschner Casting. And we cast, um, I wanna say everything, some films, uh, lots of theater, probably at one point for 10, 15 different regional theaters and they do six plays a year. So you're casting 100 plays wow. a year. I had three Broadway shows, none of which ran long, a lot of off-Broadway, but I really cut my teeth in the New York theater scene. And then by chance, I ended up going to the television show, the ABC So Loving. Uh, it became yeah. an account yeah. for our company. Uh, and... Loving was a half hour show on ABC created by Agnes Nixon. And they only had me there three days a week. And the other two days I'd go back to my office. So I was 
juggling, you know, one day I'm dealing with theater and one day I'm dealing with daytime. Not the, the actors are different, just the process. But I really started to love casting daytime. I was just, wow, it's fast. Yeah. And you cast an actor. And a few days later, you're watching them on the screen. Yeah. A few weeks after that, they're on television. So you get this immediate visceral sense and thrill of your work, whereas you can cast a play and it opens in four, four weeks after the rehearsal and it closes right. or a film that never comes out. But with daytime, yeah. an actor's hired, they work, and they're on the air. And I, I find that a rush. I have to tell you, <clears throat> so... That was 1985. So I've been casting daytime uh, about almost 38 years, and it's still a rush to me to cast an actor. You've been casting daytime 38 years? Uh, almost. I've been casting That's General it. Hospital 32 and a half years. Almost oh eight, almost 8,000 episodes, yeah. But it's still, it's still a rush for me to cast an actor and watch the work and they're on the air. And by the way, I don't just mean series regulars. I mean day players no, recurring, I know. even the under fives, yeah. which we care a lot about. You yeah. know, I watch the show and you just want to feel like, yeah, that fits. That makes the scene better. That's a great part yeah, of the show, yeah. no matter how small the role might appear. But I still, I still love it because it's such a grind daytime. I don't have to tell you. I mean, you're, you're entrenched, but it's a train. Yeah. And it's 250 episodes a year. So you can't become complacent. You no. can't become lazy. You can't, there's no real downtime, which by the way, I'm grateful for, but it's a lot. So you have to love it in order to just keep going and caring about it. So uh, before we get into you, the great uh, casting of GH, and uh, let's talk some mental health. Just sure. because, you know, just to, like growing up, uh, did you endure any, any mental health? Did you, what, what did you think of mental health back then? Cause I know when I was a kid, it was like, what the hell is that? You know, when I was a kid, these kind of things weren't addressed in school. They weren't really acknowledged. There was no, I mean, there were people to help people with mental health. There were psychiatrists and yeah. therapists, but it wasn't talked about openly the way it is now where there's no stigma to someone getting help. If anything, most people, when they hear somebody's getting help, are like, yeah, I could use some help. But back then, you know, growing up in high school in the 70s, this was something that was really not discussed or dealt with. It was sort of, you just had to deal with it, whatever you were dealing with on your own, on your own. and just kind of figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on my self-awareness through the years and, you know, what are things that in my mind I have to overcome? What are my vulnerabilities? Uh, now it's very different, thank God, where people, everybody needs some degree of help, but people really have access yeah. to getting yeah. getting help, which, which all of us need. Yeah, you know, you want to, you want to, and that's what I, I've been trying to do and, and is normalize it. It's not, you know, everybody should be talking about it because it's when we don't talk about it is when we hold it in. You know, I, I talked about this once on State of Mind where I was in high school and a, my fr a friend of mine was having a nervous breakdown. And it hurts me to say, but we avoided him. I didn't want to even go near him because he, all he talked about was God and God saving the world and God this and God that. And, and we didn't know what that was or it's, right. you know, a nervous breakdown. Okay, but he's talking weird. Let's run away from him. Three years later, four years later, I'm in a mental institution having the same thing. Worse. Well, you're being open. Now, really open, yes, and with a very visible forum has helped, yes, so many people, yes, because so many people are watching and saying, That's me, that's right, that's me, that's right. Whether they already knew that's me or whether they 
all of a sudden realize that's me and it encourages people to to get help yes acknowledge it and also understand they're not alone people going oh, through Mark, stuff are not good. they're not alone so when you're when you write a book when you do an appearance yes. when you're on Oprah and you're yes. very open yes it destigmatizes yeah you know i saw this i hate to say it again but it's the truth i woke up yesterday from a nap and i saw and spectrum was on my tv and i'm like oh i'm doing it tomorrow and the first words I, I, this to me, there's no coincidences. But first words were mental health. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what mental health? They have benches, which I think is beautiful, man. It made it. It it it, it, it makes me so happy to see this. They have benches at at schools, like you know, colleges and whatnot, that say buddy bench, so wow. you can sit there. And somebody could come up and sit there and just talk. And this the girl was saying, you know, I needed somebody to talk to. And it was great. So, and I think, I, and this is what I want this to be. If we're talking and somebody's watching going, like you said, oh, my God, I've been through that. Oh, what Mark said about this, what Mark said about that. And now I feel like, because you have to understand, people with mental illness, and this is the way I felt it early, early on is that you, you feel like you're kind of an alien, like nobody understands you and you're kind of weird and not anymore, Mark, because the pandemic has helped. There's a, it's a curse and a blessing. I'm going to say it until I blew in the face. The cur, the cur, the, the blessing is so much awareness more than ever commercials on TV. If you're bipolar, if you have anxiety. It's amazing. You didn't see this f four years ago, three years ago. You didn't see it. It's great. The The curse is enormous amount of suicides. That's the, that's needs to be fixed. Okay. But I see that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, everybody struggles. Yes. But some people struggle more than others. And I think that there is definitely this awareness that there is help available. Yeah. But like you talk about the suicides, this is tragic. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, and a lot of them are, are kids, they're high school. You know, I have a 17-year-old daughter who's in high school. And just high school is challenging for a kid. There's so much pressure academically and yeah. socially. And these kids are under such a different pressure yes. than when I was a kid. It was really yeah. pretty simple. You went to school, you had your friends. Now you've got uh, social media. You, you just everybody's comparing themselves to this false image of what people are. And the challenges for these kids as they have to navigate, not just academically, but emotionally, the landmines of being a teenager, of being in high school, it's like it's never been this way. And no, so... No. You just hope that kids that are struggling will reach out for help or that if their family sees something, they will encourage their yes their kid to reach out for help. Teenagers, they have to feel like they're not alone. That's true. And when you're a teenager, you feel you're very alone. So yeah. it's just it's just a struggle. Answer me something because I, uh, I had this conversation quite a lot lately. And I think now that we're talking, two things I want to talk to you about, Mark, about children. It, it, here's one that just drives me. Somebody told me to watch 60 Minutes one night about children with mental illness. It takes sometimes four months, sometimes a year to get, see a psychiatrist. You can't take it. It's, how, how fast is it to end your life? Right. You can't wait months. That's right. And of I've been not. in that situation. So, but for children, it just angers me. Okay, that's that's fine. American Idol. You have a good perspective because you 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 cast young kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was watching with my daughter Heather, and the first live <laughs> American Idol. 
these there was 24 kids incredible that's not i've been watching since the first american idol and they're always stiff scared nervous not these no nerves at all incredible and i look over at heather and i said hey baby what is this she goes the new generation the young generation and i said and your daughter is the young generation well she's a little yeah pretty much but i'm talking yeah she is the young generation there's uh there's no nerves like my son joshua has no nerves like i at his age i was like even even now you know what i mean uh what is that with the young generation is that growing up i think it has to do with especially when you come from money that you haven't been through anything and the phones and the social media i don't know but i i've seen a huge difference this year than i have in the past well first of all there's a lot of talent out there is and that unlike, it and unlike years ago there's an outlet for that talent i don't oh. you know i don't think that talent relates to socioeconomic or whether you're wealthy or struggling you. everybody has a voice inside them but you. but these incredible voices you're hearing it's yes. they grow up where music is everywhere you have an outlet to hone your performing whether it's youtube TikTok. kids you. are yes. performing right. so they're becoming much more polished whereas when i was a kid I keep saying when I was a kid, which now makes me officially feel ancient, but there was no <laughs> outlet, you know, there oh, was, you're no, right. you're there right, was no Mark. way if you were living in the middle of nowhere, you had no way of getting your voice heard. Now, if you're really sensational, somebody's going to take notice on YouTube or there's an American idol or there's the voice, there's anything. places yeah. to be seen. So now the game is really up because you have access to being heard. And I think we're hearing a lot of incredible talent that may have been there for a long time that nobody was aware of because they weren't being right. marketed or had no access. But it does make sense, Mark, that now you can go, well, that's the beauty of even mental health where you can go like I did and, and research uh, a, a medication and see from, hear from other people how, you know, and then, uh, same with music. You can you can actually, I mean, my son learned how to play the piano through, yep, the guitar. So you're you're absolutely right. Fifteen years ago, whenever American Idol came up, there wasn't that. You couldn't. And even if they were out there, you wouldn't know. But now, I mean, you look at America; it's got talent. Yeah, uh, American Idol, The Voice. There are some incredible now. Would incredible you cast voices for young actors? Like, do you see a difference now in the, the, the confidence level or is it just the same? I can't say that I've seen a difference in the confidence level through the years, but some kids are just remarkably confident. Yes. You interviewed Jophia Love. I think we cast her when uh, she she's was, a, she's the I think cutest. we cast her when she was four years old. I don't know what the definition of a confident four-year-old is, but she was it. So I think some kids just have that innately. Some kids develop it. Yeah. And then of course, some kids don't develop it. And that's, that's a challenge as well. Uh, but the kids that we see, the kids we hire, there's a couple of things about, if you, if you look at all the kids on the show, whether they're, you know, the 16 year olds that are now 19. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Eden and Jeff, Will, and separate from talent, they all had, they were very present. Mm. They weren't precocious. They weren't trying to be cutesy. They were authentic, where you just feel in a strange way that you're in the presence of an old soul. Yeah. When right, these right. kids come in the room, and there's this, you know, we give pretty challenging audition scenes for these kids because we throw so much story at them. So it's not enough to be adorable. They have to tell story. So when you give the material, you, it's interesting, the, the ones that we've hired have just been, they make the material authentic and real where it's not like they're pretending or trying to act. They're just- Just being. They're just being. Yeah. I mean, they, there's a skill set, but there's a presence about them. Have you ever auditioned somebody you didn't hire 
because you thought, uh, and then they become huge, like in the prime time or movies. Um, absolutely. In fact, there's not a single. <laughs> That's the best. There's not a single casting director I know. in the world that hasn't not hired somebody. But at the same time, you have to remember in casting, we're not the final say. So That's we true. may have believed in that actor and given them the opportunity, but we didn't sign off That's or true. we may just have not felt they were right for the role. Yeah. It yeah. just, every casting director has that. And some who you don't hire, you know, there's magic there. You oh, know, really? you know, they're going to be amazing. We didn't hire them. Either somebody passed yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah. And then there are others where, you just don't see it. And then years later, they've become an actor. And then you see it. Oh, that's cool. So it just, it's just, you know, I remember giving Luke Perry his first job, series regular role on, on oh. Loving. He was 19 years old. He was, uh, I think he was laying tar, building driveways. No. And he wasn't at that point the most skilled actor, but he oh. was so confident and charismatic oh, he was and confident. that and that came through on the screen so that was not confidence based on on the skilled actor it was i'm confident as a human being and then yes. he grew as an actor interesting in that storyline the two other actors in the love triangle got their first jobs kelly rutherford and terry polo all three got their first jobs in this really <sighs> cute romantic storyline the they were not on the show long, as long as they should have been. But them not being on the show anymore did not hurt their career wow. because they were then available to do other things. I always tell actors that it's one thing to want the role, but getting cast in that particular role in that show, you're not getting cast might work out great for you six months from yeah. now, a year from now, yeah. you don't know. You're all of a sudden available for something amazing mm -hmm. that might happen. And I think for survival emotionally for an actor, that is one way to process this. You know, we're talking about mental health and awareness. The actor's life, it's so vulnerable. Uh. You're, you're, you need work. You want work. You pursue work. Mm -hmm. And you finally get an opportunity. And you worked on the material. And you, you leave your heart and soul in the room. You feel good about what you do. Yeah. And then you don't hear from them. You yeah. don't get cast. Yeah. And so it goes into the void. And so emotionally for an actor to sustain that you have to have such inner strength to survive and navigate the ups and downs of an acting career. Or somebody with you who could, like I had. You were very blessed. I started with my mother and then it went to my wife. And cause I don't think I could have done it alone. Mm -hmm. Not with my, I had confidence, but I also have, I have, I'm very fragile. So it's both. And, you know, I, if the fragile hit, it would have been tough without somebody helping you. But you're absolutely right. Very difficult. Very difficult. And then you, so you have to have this thick armor to survive mm -hmm. being an actor. Yet when you're in the room, what's most dynamic about it's an vulnerable. actor is their vulnerability. vulnerability yeah. The vulnerability yeah. is the the core right. for an actor. I always say vulnerability creates I'm possibility. With I'm with you. Vulnerability creates possibility. Yeah. And yet you have to be so invulnerable to navigate the business. And then you have to have this beautiful open heart to do the exquisite work. And it's, it's a journey for an actor. It is a journey. whether an actor's working or not. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a journey. Yeah. Let's talk now about, the people that you've cast. I'll, I'll put I'll Maurice Bernard. <laughs> so my, my situation, uh, I mean, it's everywhere, but you know, I was out of work. I owed money to two, uh, two years out of, you know, 
I've done de de playing Desi Arnaz and then running out of money and then GH calls. I don't want to do it. My wife says, yeah, you do. I said, no, I don't. And she goes, we're broke. And I said, all right, let's go. <laughs> and I met with Wendy Rich, Shelly Curtis. I think I sat with you. Right. You were actually in the casting waiting room waiting to be called in to meet with Wendy and Shelly. And then we all went in and you were just sitting there. We, was, for you though, you went in knowing that you had a job at that point. Cause we made it clear. Yeah. We, we want you. Yes. This wasn't like, let's see how it goes. We want yes. you. And you were offered two roles. <laughs> you were offered Dr. Boransky, the series regular role. And you were offered the six month role of Sonny Corinthos. Right. You jumped at six months because you didn't want to stick around. You jumped at that. Right. And you know, here we are 29 years later, it's still a short term role. Yeah. But I remember you had the choice. I remember your answer. And, but that's an example of you chose door number one instead of door number two. So that choice yeah. led to, that to 29 where you years. are. But now. you know, the beauty of, of GH, I just told somebody yesterday, that's probably why I've been there 29 years is because of the loyalty that you showed me after two, three weeks when I had a nervous break, my third nervous breakdown, and I quit the show. Did you, what, what did you think about that? Did you know that, did you think, what the, this guy's not here now and he's not coming, what, what'd you think? Well, I, I knew about it when it went down. Okay. Um, and again, this is, 29 years ago yeah. where navigate trying to understand what somebody's going through. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't quite put it into words. You heard words. bipolar though at that Yes, time. we heard yeah. bipolar. And I remember Shelly calling you and talking to you on the phone about coming in because I was with her and just talking to you and just being, she was very present and something clicked where you said, okay, I'm going to come back. But when it first happened, which was really early in your run. Yeah. Th three weeks. Yeah. I think it was, yeah, I, I don't really, but I remember when it happened yeah. and there was initially says what's going on, but the powers that be responded in a very nuanced way. Whoa. Like they really heard. I think you felt heard. Oh, I just felt like somebody else could have fired me in two seconds. They, we wanted you, it everybody was beautiful. It for you. And there was this sense of, okay, Let's work with Maurice yeah. to help him navigate as much as we can. Yeah. All of this. And I think when you came back, I mean, you have Paula as your anchor, but I think work became a real anchor for you. Yeah. Gave you this security and a way to express yourself. Yeah. But the first day that I told Shelly in my room, I couldn't remember one word. One that I don't remember. And she's in there and I'm crying on her shoulder. I said, I can't do it. I'm not going to go upstairs and do this. Because nobody knew me up there. Like now they'd be like, right. oh, Marie, it's cool. You know, there are all these, you know, the cameraman looking at you. And she goes, and I'll never forget. She said, we'll take it page by page, line by line, or word by word if we have to. And that made me walk. That reached you. Up, upstairs and, and do it. And it wasn't easy, but I did it. And every day got a tiny bit uh, easier. So that's why that's, that's. The I did not know that story. You know, it's interesting because I remember all the stories, yeah. people's first days in yeah. casting. Was, and, you know, I remember, of course, that three week phone call. Yeah. But I was not made aware of until now that that was going on downstairs and that was said to you and that you were struggling that much. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think I was removed from that process. Yeah. So let's talk about Vanessa Marceau. I you guys were great together. <laughs> it was magic. You know, it's funny about Vanessa. Um, and she knows this story and she's actually told this story. Vanessa was very raw. Yeah. But, we, there was just something, this star quality, this presence, this beauty, this soulfulness, she was complex. It was everything. And uh, we saw, I saw hundreds of women. Vanessa, I believe, was the only actress we tested for the role. We wanted her so much, we just, we tested 
her and it worked out. But here's the interesting story. She came into the waiting room. And so when I'm auditioning a contract role, I'll see anywhere from 200 to 800 people for that role, depending on the role, you the age. Yeah. Um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but Vanessa came in and she's, so you average about 40, 45 actors a day and I spread it out. So it's not a cattle call. So you might have three or four actors sitting in the room for a few minutes. And then I bring each one in to my room and they read with me in my office opposite me. Vanessa was looking around the room and she thought, these women are so beautiful. I'm never going to get this. She got up to leave. And as she was leaving, I opened the door and I said, Vanessa, and she says she looked at me and knew she was going to get the role. Really? Now, here's the interesting thing, because we're talking about mental health and yeah. how. So Vanessa looked around the room and thought, I'm not pretty enough. And she was currently being aired on MTV as the most beautiful, beautiful. girl in the world on the Prince video. The Prince so video. the most beautiful girl in the world didn't think she was pretty enough and almost left. So that's an example that's where she right. psyched herself yeah. out right. and all the internal chatter and, and what people and actors do, compare yourself to others, which of course is so dangerous to do because everybody's where they are. Yeah. And then, you know, as cliche as it is, the rest became history. She really took off. And of course she grew as an actress and, you know, won awards, but you know, we saw in her something and to her credit, she did the work to get there. And I think being paired with you really lit a fire under her. Yeah. I mean, all these actors that I've worked with, the young actors, they're all hard workers, man. And you've done the greatest job of hiring them because they have talent. I got to be honest, I'm not great at working with people who don't have talent. I don't have the patience. I mean, maybe an acting, that's why acting coaches are great. I don't have it. But somebody like a Vanessa where I go, mm, there's, uh, or Steve Burton or whoever, Brian, whoever else, are, the talent's there. I just got to, you got to hone it a bit and give them confidence. But you see the talent from the beginning. Some already bring the talent into the room. Others, you see there's talent, but it needs to be, nurtured you can't hire somebody but you can't do anything about that mark once you hire them you can't teach you can't go and teach them anymore right you get your job no done. my job's done yeah. but their job's just beginning i know to so every actor's different i mean a great example is michael sutton oh stone man, yeah. you guys had one of the most beautiful relationships on television yeah. and it was really it felt like brothers in real life it was magical well we tested seven actors for that role we, we screen tested seven actors one of them had won two daytime emmys some had worked some had, michael had the least credits of anybody as in maybe no credits other than studying but when he was on the screen so soulful and honest and authentic and he beat out all these established young actors for this great role and he went from really being raw to becoming this really lovely actor in his journey in the show because we saw that but the act even if we see it, the actor still has to put in the work and do and, yeah. and challenge themselves and and, and grow or they're not going to be on the show and they're or they're not going to have a career yeah it's not enough you know it's not enough to be great looking because everybody in this town that comes in is great looking you've got to be skilled you've got to care about the craft of acting it's not about i want to make it it's about i need to act yeah and that's the difference yeah, that's right. between the ones that that's right. make it and have longevity versus the ones that maybe after a few years can't do it anymore because it's a brutal business. Unless you love the craft of acting as an actor, you'll be miserable. It's true. And it's too difficult if you don't need to act. That craft has got, for me, you know, early on training and whatnot, I wanted to be the best actor in the world. That's what I strive for. Mm -hmm. And thank God I had that and I wasn't relying on, well, I wasn't going to rely on my my height, that's for sure. <laughs> I always say it's not your height, it's your stature. 
but I was modeling at the time. It was the worst. All the girls were taller than I was, and I failed miserably. Um, what about Steve Burton? Steve was, I believe, 17 or 18. And he had just come off. And he that, had the hair and stuff? He had, like, blonde surfer hair. I mean, he was a surfer dude. Uh, but he was... but. He also could act because he'd been he'd been on the sitcom. I know, out of this world. out of this world, and but there was something about him that was really right for the role and ready for the producer session. And at the last minute, Gloria Monty, who was the producer at the time, she was there. Oh, she she was. was there for a year. Uh, she was the producer at the time. She said to me, "I want all of these boys to be six feet tall." Well, we're already in the callback session, and being six feet should never be a determining factor. You go with the best I agree. actor un unless there's a specific reason for it. And it's the first time, by the way, and the only time I've ever cast a role in General Hospital where somebody randomly said they have to be a certain height. So I said to Steve, how tall are you? He said, about five, ten and a half. Yeah, that's true. I said, you need to be six feet in 15 minutes. <laughs> so he happened to be wearing high top Doc Martens. And this was back in the day when people read the newspaper and General Hospital had a waiting area and there would always be the LA Times. We went in the bathroom. We stuffed his shoes. No. We stuffed his shoes with newspaper. So when he walked out of the bathroom, he was six feet tall. And he got the role. Not because he was six feet tall. No, but, yeah. but it didn't become an issue, which it shouldn't have been in the first place. But we were like, let's just what? do what we can. So, newspaper saved his life. That's amazing. I didn't. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, and he he knows the story very well because it was just such a random comment that an actor had to be a certain height, and I I just I felt he had a real shot, and I didn't want any perception that he wasn't going to be the height that was required. Even though technically, really, there's no requirement for height. Some of the greatest oh, come actors on, yeah. are. Dustin Hoffman, Al Pacino, we can go Maurice down. Maurice Bernard, we can go down the list. We can go down the list. You know, I when I, all my children, when I first uh, screen test for the, I hadn't gone in yet. There, there was like five actors. And the producer come, he didn't know I was in this room. He went into the next room. And he comes up and he goes, I got him. We got him. And he had a headshot of the actor that they just read. And, I, and I'm like, uh, well, I guess uh, I get in this one. And it was, you know, it kind of took a little off me, like maybe relax a little bit that I just know I, he's, they got the guy. So I auditioned and then uh, they, they said, can you come back tomorrow for another role? So I did. And then went back to the hotel. I'm leaving in the morning. And I tell you, I needed to get, because this was, at a time in my life where I needed to get it. Sure. I really did. And they called and they said, you didn't get out of the role, but we're creating a role called Nico. It's the greatest feeling in the world, man. When they're creating the role, yeah. you, that's great. It's the, and I did that. You know. I don't know, Mark, I think we've covered. And you know, who knows what happened to the actors that got yeah, yeah, exactly. the role. It's just, it's just, that's the, mystery anything else you want to talk about no i'm good i mean i i, I, I think we had a good I, run here i i really enjoy a lot of mental show. health more than i thought yeah well this is it's it's the core of what your show is about yeah but i think if maybe i touched on some way that we in casting yes know how challenging it is for an actor we, we get it yes we get the vulnerability required to pursue this career. The, the vulnerability to be in the room. You know, it's not casting director, actor. It's not us against them. No. Casting directors are rooting for the actor. I we know. Every actor that comes in, we want them to be amazing because, first of all, it makes our job much better. Worst feeling in the world is you feel like you haven't found it yet. But, Mark, the thing is, I get that, and we all should hear that and understand that. But not every casting director is as nice as you are when they go in the room. And so, you know, all that kind of goes out the window of your rooting when you go in and they're like, I understand. You could feel an energy that. or you feel you're rejected the right. moment you walk in the room. 
most casting directors really do try to create I know they a nurturing do. environment. I mean, I've always felt like, first of all, actors, it's so, having been an actor for a short period, I try to treat actors the way I would have loved to be treated. Right. Well, but from the selfish point of view is, if I create an environment where the actor feels safe and comfortable, they're gonna do better work. So I'm gonna get them at their best if I create the space for them yes. to do their best. So it's win-win. Yes, we're both the same here. Look, when I'm at, on the set and you bring in a guy who's playing Dex or the, the other guy, or they, they're so good. But I just like to help them because, because I'm a good guy, like you're a good guy. But I, if they're better, I'm better. Yep. So if, very true. If there's a way I can, they can say a certain thing, and then we can both benefit. And and so we both speak the same language. And uh, I appreciate you coming here. This let is me, fun. Let me say, and it's fun. It's like a, just like a. We're just hanging yeah, out. Hanging out, yeah. Like, Usually it's in your dressing room. Or in your office. You know, right. or in my office yeah. where you've popped up. But this is really nice. Living room. I like it. So it was a great talk that I had with uh, Mark Tesher. And it was a lot more about mental health than I am pleasantly surprised. Very happy. Mark is, he's, Mark Tesher is not just one of the best cast directors. He's very intelligent. Uh, is very intuitive, and I think that's what makes a casting director. And and also the fact that he makes the actors feel comfortable when they walk in the room means a great deal because I've been in many rooms. Let's just put it that way. All right, brother. Thank you. Happy to be here.